conversation today between Luis Sagu, who is the artist of the show that's up right now in Bolt, and with Matt Mota, yeah. and then with Faye Gleiser, who's going to be moderating the conversation. So um, without further ado, I'll let you guys go ahead and get started. I guess one question I have for you guys is, do you allow questions throughout the discussion, or would you prefer afterwards? Throughout? <laughs> okay. So if any of you have questions, feel free to chime in. Uh, yeah. uh, thank, thank you, Teresa. I appreciate it. I apologize. I'm trying to get the audio recording here. Um, okay, we're all set up. Uh, yeah, thanks, Teresa. Um, thank you for um, allowing me to be a part of the Chicago Artists Coalition and being the Bolt Residency. So I've been making work here for about a year. I uh, just recently moved out downstairs. There's a whole set of new awesome artists that you guys should check out. Um, and through this residency was how I, I had the honor of meeting Faith. Uh, we did a studio visit. Um, and I thought I would start off a little bit by saying um, why the three of us are here today. And Faye um, was kind enough to moderate this talk. And I felt that she was an important part of this piece because uh, she connected. Did you guys ever been to the NCA recently? Um, like a few months ago, there was a show titled The Making of a Fugitive. That was an amazing exhibit. Remember we, yeah. yeah. Um, and then that exhibit, um, just as the title references, of making the other features, like how the way I took from it is like how you uh, perceive a certain individual based on uh, certain perspectives or or shifting of life experiences in a way, like a, a fugitive may be somebody that we go after, that we find as a villain. But to somebody else, this fugitive uh, is a symbol of hope. It could be something else, and it's just about context uh, and understanding, in a way, um, which I felt was relevant to sort of the, the topic which we're going to address, which is uh, growing up in you know an environment that we call the hood, and how those experiences have shaped our life. Um, and on that note, I work at the MCA as a tour <laughs> guide, uh, giving tours to Chicago Public students. Um, and there I had the honor of meeting Matt, uh, who is amazing, and I've been learning so much from him. And we just, from like showing up to work early, having conversations, started realizing that we had a lot in common. Uh, we did this uh, program together where we went to the South Side and we taught, and on our way back from, the, from that park, from teaching with students, we just started talking, right? I remember you asked me, like, how'd you make it out the hood? You yeah. know? And I was like, kind of still like a little bit scared, like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, because you said, how'd you make it out? Yeah. You didn't say yeah. Like, how'd you make it out? I was like, uh, I don't know, what do you mean, man? Yeah. <laughs> like, I was like, like uh, the, the, just even in a car next to him, no one there, I was still kind of very afraid of, of opening that part of me, of, like, even knowing. I knew what you meant, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so thank, I'd like to thank both of you for coming out. And Matt is an amazing vocalist. Um, and we collaborated particularly with this show, with the second performances with uh, Baby Babylon. Yeah. And for those of us. Yes. Yeah. And so um, he was amazing in allowing me to use some of his tracks from his album. What's that title? Um, oh, so, yeah. so, um, so thank you. And with that, thank you everyone for coming on this hot Sunday. Um, and oh. Actually, as I'm speaking, I have some amazing students coming in. Hey guys, come on in and have a seat where you like. Yeah. Hey, Louise. Thank you for making it out. Thank you. Hey, buddy. Uh, so, I was just doing introductions, um, and we were just about to open the floor to start the conversation, okay? Okay, so I'll take it from there. So, um, it's, really, it's really an honor to be here speaking with both of you uh, today, and so I wanted to just give you a sense of what, what we hope to do. I mean, mostly this is an open-ended conversation. I have some prompts to kind of lead us through some of the speaking points that Matt and Lise uh, mentioned. You know, when they, when they reached out to me and they said, we we're hoping to have a conversation around these concepts of testimony and perseverance and guilt and trauma. 
And so that's a very tall order. And so we're here with the understanding that, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. We will not cover everything. And and really my goal as the moderator for this kind of conversation is to get you both to uh, share as much as you can about your story, you know, the stories that you want to share and how they have become materially manifest as artwork and, and sound and you know objects. But also I, I'm really interested in what kinds of questions drive you. You know, what questions your work asks because that's how I come to having conversations about art. It's really, especially when I hear, and this is something all of us share, we're museum educators too, and my background is in museum education. And so, um, man, I was just talking about this, but when you, you know, when you hear some kind of resistance, when someone sees an art and you're like, I, you know, I don't get it, or it's not for me, and I, or I, I, you know, I just don't like that. I really hear them saying, I don't understand the questions that this work is asking. Or when someone says they really love a work of art, they're really saying, like, those questions resonate with me. So I'm hoping to get you both to talk about the questions that drive you. And, and that was kind of, you know, I really love this phrase. I think Matt used when, when you were when we were preparing for this conversation and you were I was asking, you know, what could I do to best facilitate this conversation? And you used the phrase like spirit guide instead of just a monitor. <laughs>
little bit. We were having some technical difficulties before. But um, uh, just to give me an idea, this song is called Babylon Lullaby. And um, it, it talks about, from the perspective of um, someone who is homeless or who's out on the outside, and looking in to people that are affluent or someone that just lives better than them, you know? Um, and, and talking about what that feels like. So it's, it's meant to be, though, not like just this, you this, you this, more like, shh, go to sleep, it's okay, it's all right. And while the baby is sleeping, um, the person can come and get some of the riches that uh, the baby celebrates with. So um, music and songwriting became another avenue for me to kind of express um, uh, both my, uh, my, my own creativity but also uh, became a coping mechanism for me um, uh, coming out of, of the hood, but also while I was in the hood, um, always feeling like just outside. Like I always say, like, you know, always feeling just outside and in, no matter what kind of position or space um, that, that you can occupy. And so um, we, uh, we talk about this idea of being, um, uh, you know, a refugee or, um, or the idea of trauma or, or so on. I, I identify a lot with that, that kind of kind of symptoms. I'll play something live a little bit later, because I had a feeling this was not working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So on that note, I think I could, um, I'd like to talk about one of the sculptures in this piece that's called, uh, it's titled Baby. And um, also, Baby comes from the word Babylon, which was one of the things that really connected just Matt and I, not titled anything about the same ideas. And for me, I made, um, I created a mythology in which this mythology, as this sculpture up here, um, had a lot to do with nature. And I made this piece, um, instead of thinking of like the audience as, as people, but more like the audience as nature, and I made this as a dedication to the moon. And in my mythology, when people die, their souls go through our moon and come into my mythology, into my story. And in that story, Baby is my friend that was uh, killed when he was, uh, he was uh, still a teenager, maybe a little older. Um, and he, he was a barber, and he was just working, and they came in to rob the barber shop in Chicago. And um, they ended up just taking, I think, less than $100, um, and then someone put a gun to his head and asked him for his cell phone. Uh, my friend gave him the cell phone, and they still shot him. Um, and so my friend's name is Daniel Moreno. Um, and it's actually the first time I've ever told anybody who, in public what the name is. And Daniel comes from the, I was finding ways to title my pieces, and this sculpture, Baby, comes from the book of Daniel, the idea of being in Babylon. And, and Daniel, this, like, Baby serves as this um, interpreter of dreams. And so my, in my mythology, Baby, represents a connection from this world into this mythology. Um, and so maybe he's the, the fish guy, like the puffer of the fish is made out of concrete there. Yes, I think one of the things we were, we were talking about, the similarities, not even just the name of Baby in the song, that I did, it was this Baby Babylon playing on this, this idea of um, looking at, you know, affluence as being just like a child, you kind of, but also a um, myth, how mythology plays both of our our works and expressions, and um, 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 just bringing other things into it, like a, a story or a narrative or a, like a, um, a, a fable. And, and a lot of times, um, I, I try to, I think it's, it's, I don't know, it's more palpable when you make it into this kind of dream place. Um, the, the name, my name, my stage name, Motep, um, actually comes from um, this like ivory elephant that my dad had on his, his um, little drawer or whatever. It was like the one thing that I, I was not allowed to touch, so I played with it all the time. Um, <laughs> we left. And uh, <laughs> so, it's, it's, so I didn't have this, this dream world, you know, this idea of like being like an elephant prince and like had this elephant. And so um, MOTEP is an acronym for Matthew of the Elephant Princes. But also, um, MOTEP uh, was a, a great architect of the second dynasty in, 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 in Egypt. And so, it really is just, it's just being able to get inside of of, uh, of imagination, and if, if you ask like the most questions that, that drive you, I'm always wondering if whatever I'm doing is going to lead to one of those moments of like, oh, you know, 
out of that. And then it's like I said, chaos, 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 I'm not doing. Oh, now this, oh yeah, it's what connects, yeah. And then I'm going to do it again. So <laughs> um, I'm always looking for that, so I'm asking myself that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this idea of escaping and creating mythologies, we see it in, like, in movies and comic books. And I think where, well, at least for me when I was younger, um, it was a way to to forget. Like I remember after you know going to college and, and sort of ignoring everything that had happened in my life and, and being in those situations, I had forgotten the names of my friends that were murdered. You know, really close to me, and like when someone finally asked me, I was like, "Oh, well, what was his name?" You know, like, I just forgot. It was like a way of shutting down and then just living this other thing. But the other side of the coin for that, as an artist, I don't see my mythology as a way to escape. I see it as a different way of more of confrontation. Mm. Like really dealing with this now, mm -hmm. and um, but tackling that like straightforward in a way, but in a more mythological, maybe poetic or different kind of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like you know, for me, um, bringing in myth, bringing in fable, bringing in story may seem strange to add that with something that's really happening, but you know, when these things are happening, there doesn't seem to be a reason. It seems like chaos, right? And so um, it was a way of kind of like um, creating reason out of it, doing it from a different angle, like a you know, uh, metaphor or storytelling, whatever, can help you arrive in a different kind of way. Or at least you can make one up. Because when you're looking around and you know, uh, you know, friends of yours are, who were just around are, are you know, dead, and there seems to be this, this system that is purposely weighing against you. Um, it's very hard to like, you know, keep yourself buoyant, um, you know, while that's going on without, without I think you ever have a great imagination. In fact, a lot of people that I knew, they were my friends in the hood, like comic books, had great imaginations, like, you know, watch the animation, like all that, all that. And some, even though that was never like, it's like that on, in the mainstream media that was never really told or expressed and, you know, there was a lot of, there was a lot of songs at the time hip hop that talk about that. Um, but just as much as someone would might celebrate their um, masculinity, bravado, um, there was also a lot of people who were had these great creative kind of you know, arts in, their, in, in, in themselves, great imagination. You know. I think, like, for me also connecting like a story or something, I feel like it's really human. I, see if I had this entry when you were talking, but the idea of like, like I shared with my students uh, this video where, and like this video of Chicago Heights and I, I zoomed in and I right across the street in the public library, I had just gotten this new bike that my mom bought and uh, these like gang bangers, you know, rival guys like came up and tried to get me with poles and take, to take my bike, right? And so I think that like in moments of like a lot of pain, also one of my friends that was murdered was beaten to death with bats and for his friends. And so I see it as a way, like, you know when you're in so much pain, like, the, your brain just kind of shifts, goes somewhere else, um, as a way, as a mechanism to maybe not feel, or to be outside of yourself in some weird, liminal kind of perspective. I like making that connection. Yeah. Because, like, now you have more of the control of the story. That's yeah. To follow up on what you were just saying, I was thinking you know, this is the first kind of public setting where you said your friend's name out loud. Mm -hmm. um, I, one of the questions that I've heard you talk about before is something that motivates your work is who's, who do these stories belong to? Mm -hmm. You know, in this very precarious kind of position that you feel like you're in where it's your story, but it's other people's story and not wanting to take claim of something that will cause pain for someone else when you share part of it. So you could both talk to me to that kind of struggle or you know difficulty with ownership of the story and the, the larger question of who, who do these stories belong to? That's good. Yeah, when I first started just thinking about the idea of talking about these issues, um, that was the first thing that I talked with actually a really good friend of mine who wrote the essay on my work. If you guys get a chance, you should check it out. I really enjoyed it. And um, we talked about whose story does it belong to. Does it belong to their family only? Um, 
is their family going to be okay with me talking about their son or daughter um, and what happened, right? And also the idea of like, just like when you're an artist, if there's a lot of research-based artwork where like, let's say someone invites me to do a show at a new neighborhood that I've never been at and then I just start doing research and I'm like, oh, this is an interesting story, I'm gonna make work about it. So almost in a way, sometimes stories is a, is a, is a and I, you know, I'm kind of hesitant because I, I know artists look like it's not bad or good, but it's an easy way to, to start a field to make something creative. And so I don't want people to think, you know, that's my biggest fear, that um, I'm using what happened to my friends as a way to latch on to it just to make work about it, right? Um, but, you know, working these issues out and being aware of these things, it just makes me realize that, like, I'm, I hope like when I when I work about the, when I work in my artwork, I want things to be more universal. So I talk about like pain, uh, trauma, and I think that that's what everyone can connect with, whether there's different what different types of trauma, pain, or what part of the world they're from. You can still connect that. So I, I try to channel my stories into those bigger pictures rather than them just about the individual. So that way, I don't say like, well, my artwork is just about about Daniel. No, it's about like everyone who's ever suffered something. And, and hopefully that could resonate and and connect and heal. Yeah, the I mean, question thing for me that is, I mean, because you I feel like some of those the challenges to who story it is happen a lot in, from an interior standpoint. It's like I'm always I'm almost speaking for people that no longer exist or around me, but that are like, okay, well, you know, like you weren't even there, dude, or you know. Um, like, well, how many drivers are you being in, really? You know, um, and you find yourself, you can mistakenly find yourself doing this kind of comparison of like dead bodies and ghosts, and um, like everybody kind of loses. Um, the thing is, is that after a while, and in, in this world, everybody becomes a survivor if you're here long enough. I mean, you know, that's just the way that it is. And um, in that process, I think of surviving, you one has to, um, you know, I think. You, Get to reflect, um, uh, you know, and then the other thing I think is is this again this feeling, always connection to the fact that throughout that it, that, that this is isn't also just happenstance, you know, it's just that there are some things at play, um, system wise that are creating these narratives, and um, uh, that are cognizant and conscious about it, but are not then kind of putting those things out there. And that case, and that's very frustrating for me, you know? So I feel like the stories then need to be told because otherwise there, there isn't, because there's not going to be an archive. There's not going to be, um, you know, a, a, a library. There's not going to be somewhere, someone in a lot of kinds of ways that share these stories a lot of times, you know, in, 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 in this capacity that a lot of times just that very, same people, the storytellers at the end, are just as happenstance, you know, as some of these, you know, these, 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 these tragedies. So, um, so then, so then, so, so I try, to, try to, to take take one, but um, like I say, a lot of times there is some inner dialogue that happens, like you know, um, because I, I do know people that have been through a lot worse than me. And then you know, as I as I as I've gone to school and and talk with other people, you start realizing globally there are people. You know, um, I'm privileged. You know, I'm definitely privileged in comparison to that. So, you know, in that in that context, you know, um, uh, how do you then, you know, how do you then question? But I think that that the stories have to be told because um, so there's, I don't think there's, there's there's anyone else aside from from us that will do it. The survivors have to say the stories and share. Mm -hmm. In following on that too, I, so before we had this conversation, before we were able to be here today to have this conversation, I, I was asking them a few questions just to get a sense of, you know, what I should or shouldn't ask. And one of my questions was, you know, is there a subject that I shouldn't ask about or that you don't want to share publicly? And, and your answer was, uh, you know, no, I, I'm afraid, but I am ready to speak. Mm -hmm. And so it made me want to then ask, you know, was there a turning point for you 
that you can remember? And and is it entangled within your art practice or with a particular person or just you know an age like growing up at a, in a turning point when you realized that you were ready to talk or ready to make work about you know, this and that you weren't you're afraid but you're ready to be open about that kind of fear and if that if you could both think about that because it, because it seems like um, yeah there's a certain courage and vulnerability goes along with, especially if, it, if you're also asking at the same time these questions of whose story, are, who, who do these stories belong to, and then coming to terms and wanting to say, well, these stories need to be told, you know, well, how does that happen? Yeah, um, for me, it was in grad school. I, you know, when I had so much time to just think about kind of work as an artist I wanted to make, um, and then I was, I had the opportunity to travel, I did a residency in Oaxaca. I um, follow up on the lead, possibly make a sculpture in London, and I went out there, and I was able to connect with other people, and then I did a residency in New Mexico, and I was able to see how, basically what I'm trying to say, I was able to see how a lot of different artists and what they were making, and how fearless they were, and how it, it, it at the end of the day, kind of didn't really, I guess in grad school, I, I kept thinking that I had to do, I had to work a certain way, um, and once I went and traveled a little bit and saw the world that was much bigger than Chicago, much bigger than Illinois, and so forth, I felt that um, I felt I was ready, brave enough to make the work that I want to make and not be afraid to be judged or to be seen as. Like when I went to the school, I remember talking to my professor, and I was like, you know, she, she was telling me, and she was really kind of saying that I had that I was talented. And I was like, I just want to be like a sophisticated artist. And she was like, what's that even mean? I was like, I don't want to be sophisticated, like, I don't know, like, I don't know, like, you know, those paintings in Seattle, you know, like, with all that red, yeah, 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 like, Kate, I'm sophisticated, oh my god, oh my god, I think now I, I understand what you, what you meant, right, that, like, I just had to go my own path and find my own voice, and I think there was a shift somewhere towards the end of grad school where I was like, well, if I'm going to become an artist, that's hard enough, let me just do what I love to do and be, be on a project. Okay, so yeah, it's thinking about things you don't want to talk about. Um, I think, you know, what I, what I learned later was that it took me a while to, to really get an understanding of context, although I think that I knew it instinctually. I think to be able to understand that um, looking at a Kara Walker uh, um, in the context with, with Kara Walker standing there, and looking at a Kara Walker inside of a museum where the predominant white people are two different, can have two different meanings. And I think that one of the things um, I'm saying to a friend of mine, like, Okay, so if you have if you have a truth, and if it's really a truth, then most things are just going to be reflections of that. So I don't think there's a way to go into a box and pretend like equality actually exists, right? Everything will then just have to reflect inequality, mm -hmm. and that's problematic because it doesn't fit. I think a lot of narratives, and it doesn't fit commercial narrative, and it doesn't fit guilt. So I think that while this is kind of happening, what, the, the, what we want to say is, okay, we're all okay. We're all fine. You know, we can go home and, you know, but like in Chicago, for example, we know that people are dying on the south and west sides at alarming rates. How, how, do, how do we digest that? How do, how do all of us get through that? You know what I mean? Um, we all value our own families and people and well-being. You know what I mean? Even if you are one of the people that are on the block, you know what I mean? You're gonna look out for yourself and those who you love, whom you love. How could you not? So um, sometimes I guess the things that I don't want to talk about is my own selfishness, you know, and the fact that um, yeah, I never liked being in the middle of it. You know what I mean? Like I mean, I, I, I don't know, like. This whole thing about, you know, there was this, this you know, when I was going up the 90s, there was this like kind of bravado of consumption by suburban nights who didn't know what the hood was. But everybody that I knew on the streets hated it. Hated being there, 
did not want to be there. If you gave them the option and a ticket.com, they'd be there, you know? Um, so this whole process, I think, um, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's difficult. So my own selfishness, I think that is something that I, that, that I sometimes want to talk about. I would like to be a sophisticated artist. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and a lot of the kids that I work with um, would like to be sophisticated artists. And it's difficult to figure out when to tell them that it's going to be a lot harder for them to do that than a lot of other people. And um, I'm not even sure that it's impossible, but I would probably tell my nephew to have a plan B, you know, because I don't want to see him, you know, in trouble. You know? And, and also, we said this in the beginning, but for people who came later, if you have questions at any point, you know, interrupt us. We, you know, you will yeah. really enrich the conversation. Yeah. Well, if you want to say it too, just, you know. <laughs> not you, not my nephew, sorry. <laughs> 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 you know, oh, 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 Um, 
And I feel like that, that there's breaking points there too. So like, I think that that, Kinsinger, that, that, that helped me as a matter of metaphor. Um, um, one of my breaking point things. Uh, I think when I think of breaking points, I think uh, very specific moments for me. Um, one of the sculptures that I make and one of my friends, uh, one of my best friends growing up, I like it. So breaking points in the sense of like, in the movie The Moonlight is when they, the main character just, he was, they asked his partner or the, the boyfriend to hit him, and then he came back and hit the bully with like a chair. And so I always question like, uh, going back to the idea of guilt, it's like why I was able to like leave or survive in such an environment, and maybe it was um, I had a higher tolerance of breaking points, or like everyone has different personalities. Because it's like you grew up with your friends, and you guys, were, everyone's identical, everyone's the same, and then um, the situation, you know, like I. You know, after I, I, I got jumped for my bike and stuff, I, my mom worked really, really hard to put me in a better school. Um, and better meaning to have more resources. Um, and so that led me in a different path. And then my friends stayed in the neighborhood where I was. And then, you know, they were the ones that, you know, were murdered or uh, are in prison. You know, because they were more in that situation. So breaking points is, you know, when, when you're in those environments and we talked about this a little bit before, where like, um, I was a, a mentor at Northern Illinois for first year students at the Chance Program, and a lot of my, my mentees were from the hood, and they were first year in college, and made it college through the Chance Program, and um, the biggest issue, and the same issue that I had was like, how to deal with like, conflict resolution, I guess. It's like, in certain environments where like we grew up, you had to be violent. You had to know when or how to navigate and deal violence in a certain way. Um, and people, and once you went to college and people are very different from different walks of life, they act very different and they resolve conflict very different. And so those are also these breaking points. Like even if you weren't as wild and didn't go crazy and you know life didn't make you explode, you made it to college and now everyone's different than you and now the only way you know how to survive makes no sense and you're gonna get kicked out and also no one else does like you. So it's very difficult, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think too, like, you know, talking, talking about fears and things like that, um, you know, I, if, if you guys could, like, I think we've all, you know, met people that, like, the way that they resolved it was just like, oh, I'm not gonna break, you know? Like, I, I ain't gonna break at all, you know? And so then they kind of, Heal that, and that, that to me um, is the totally wrong way to go. You know, um, I was talking to my nephew, like, I have some friends that I would see again, and I'm like, wow, are you still alive? Because, like, they just was so, like, they were so bad. You know what I mean? Um, I had um, this what when I came to Chicago, there was this beautiful couple that were in one of my, um, my, 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 my staff, and um, uh, they're, they're from the Greens, could be green. And oh, they're so cute together. And, um, but neither would say I love you to the other one, you know, even though they were with each other for a while. And I, I, I asked, I asked one of them, I already named grandma. I asked grandma, like, you know, you know, what's, what's, what's the deal with that? And she was like, she's like, you know, yeah, no, like, you know, I'm not gonna say I love you. I mean, like, I don't love nobody, you know? And um, I was like, oh, 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 you know, um, just, cause I didn't know she loved them, right? She knew shit, but, they, but just the fact that, you know, you grow up with a thing where, yeah, I mean, the, the, what the system is trying to do is get you to where you don't break. It's so, so ironic that we see breaking as a weakness and not breaking as a strength, but it's actually the opposite. Because once you get to that point where you never get broke, then you never are able to care or be cared for and to show that kind of vulnerability. And one thing that I think that is imperative to being an artist, simple artist, is the ability to have empathy. You know, whether you can empathize with um, the person, your subject you're, that you're doing a portrait of, or or, or this, a scene in a movie that you're, you're editing, or the color purple, or blue. You, I mean, that I think that empathy is like an artist's uh, superpower. And so you have to be willing to kind of be broken. That's really good point. Like, I remember 
thinking about that too, where I, a year, this was recently, like a year ago, I, I went to, uh, it was just a bar with a friend, and I saw relatives of my friend that had been murdered, and so we started having a conversation, and we started talking, and they were like, I mean, they obviously cared, but they had dealt with it, or like, they were just like, talking like nothing ever happened, and here I was like in the corner, like, sad, you know, and I was just like, I got me thinking, like, I think something that artists or artists or creatives of all sorts can we just feel so much, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why we have that responsibility of, of sharing those stories is because at a different level of impacts, um, we, we feel so much. Yeah. And I think you see, I can see, you can see these people, you can see it um, with, with like animals, sort of dogs. Like when a dog is like, you can see in their eyes when they, they've already died. They've been through so much abuse and so much stuff. That, that dog isn't there anymore, it's not like, you know, it, it's lost something, you know? And I, I think it's like the equivalent of being uh, um, in like Walking Dead, you're watching you're Walking Dead, a zombie, you know? And those are zombies, people that go around and it's like, you know, they don't feel. Well, and, and I, because I want to hear more about your collaboration with Jason, because I think that was really cool. Yeah. And then you also have your collaboration with Jason, and you have your collaboration very tangible on what, why we're here right now, because both of you energized the other, you know, and, and in being able to share, there was some kind of joy or release from those conversations, so uh, how, you know, how was energy or joyfulness also a part of your own collaboration, and then I'm also just trying to figure out a way to get you to play the guitar for us. <laughs>
uh, he allowed me to um, interject and we collaborated by, I was doing a, the rosary in Spanish, I was doing the rosary, and then um, my mom's heartbeat would come in and out of the sounds. Um, so, and that, uh, it was sort of like this link of, of togetherness, and uh, you know, just to be honest too, it was just really exciting for me. Um,
about you know um, escape in the times where you're just in a situation that you don't feel like you can get out, and um, just wanting to be out of that situation. At the time I moved to Chicago, it was the Fourth of July. Um, I was finally out the hood after 27 some some odd years of, of being there, and I was like, yes, I'm in Chicago. I was in Hyde Park, and we went to the test and uh, got lost and uh, took the green line back. Um, this dude, little kid, <laughs> little kid. I mean, this dude, he must have been like 10, 11. He comes and sits next to uh, to me and my roommate, and he was like, "Hey, what's up?" I'm like, "Hey, what's up, man?" And he's like. Y'all, are y'all two, uh, y'all two dudes? And I'm like, yeah, we're not girls. So we, yeah. so what's what we know? He's like, no, nah, are y'all two dudes? You know? And I'm like, you mean are we together? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, no, nah, kid, but I'm like, would that matter? You know? And he's like, I heard y'all say you can get on this off of this stop. I'm calling my people. We're gonna kill you. And he's like, on this phone, he's like, yeah, Joe. Blah 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 blah. And he gets off the train. We'll kill you, man. Blah blah blah. So uh, we get off at a. Uh, Garfield, the Green Line was, was, was uh, being stopped at that time. Garfield on the Green Line, we get our first time being in Chicago, fireworks going off and everything. It's pitch black, ain't nobody going down the streets, and I'm like, man, how, you know, I mean, I don't even know where my house is. And the dude that I was with was like, well, we'll just ask the police officer to drive his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what? <laughs> I go with my pie behind a column, and he just goes, hey, um, we're lost. <laughs> so uh, you think this helps get us, get us home? And, um, and I was like, this dude. And the cop was like, yeah, get in. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> and he's like, oh, my, my friend is here. And he's like, OK. And I walk out, and he's like, that's your friend? I'm like, uh, hey. <laughs> you know? And uh, so we get in. In the, in the police car, and he drives us home. Oh. I drive. He drives us home. Okay, the whole time he's like, "Hey, you guys don't need to be around here." Blah, blah, blah. But it was, it was amazing. And uh, but this feeling of like, sometimes wanting to be outside of your own skin. That's what's not much about. That's good. I love you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it made it definitely made me think about the sculptures in space because I, I had a question about scale, but also volume, the way it fills the space. But I feel like now would also be a good time to open the floor. So if, you, if there are other questions, uh, it'd be great to hear them. So you have some students of yours here, I think, it, um, and I was curious about um, if, if both of you could talk about um, the relationship between your creative practice and your teaching and how they influence each other. Um, well, I think, um, you know, going back a little bit to the beginning when we talked about guilt, a lot of the, a lot of my feel to become an educator was feeling guilty that I was not the one that was murdered. Mm -hmm. And I, there was a moment where I felt that um, I needed to, to just, to, to try to make some sort of change. Um, and at that point, I was uh, in an MFA program too, and, and art was this different thing. And uh, there was this conversation happening if art could actually create change, and what does that mean? Is making a sculpture is that gonna is that gonna do anything, right? And um, my answer at that time was no. And I I decided to make to go back to Chicago Heights and do volunteer programs with with youth in high school and do talks and also in college working and helping students. Um, with FAFSA and helping students, with anything, all the resources that I didn't have. And so talking about feeling selfish, sometimes I feel a little selfish because um, working with students is so rewarding and it's so empowering that, you know, it's sort of like, 
it's just it's just really amazing. It's like, yeah, I think too, like on the selfish side of things, I had to come to terms with part of the reason I think that I, 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 I do this subliminally is to find myself at the same age, you know what I mean? Because I didn't have that, and to try and like give a helpline so I know how much is needed and how much I needed it and didn't have it. And so working with kids in that way is like, you know, this continuous, continuous kind of like, you know, search for that. Um, but also, uh, for a while, um, when I was uh, undergrad, I, you know, I gave up wanting to be a famous artist after kind of seeing the context of what that was, you know, even though I was being told by professors, you know, when Pollock paints the canvas, it's this universal gesture, or when um, um, so a dancer, a modern dancer, does these moves, it's a universal gesture, but then seeing that the people that were doing it were not universal in that kind of sense, and that the chances of me doing it were going to be hard. Yet, in, in my neighborhood, um, the marks that were left behind, for example, at my bus stop, was a blood stain from a kid who had been shot. And so, um, for a while, I just focused my energy on teaching and working with the kids. The only problem was is that that wasn't good for my lifeline, and kids continuously ask me, and, and to so to this day, um, oh, have you, have you had a have a show on our show? <laughs> have you have you been to Paris? You know, and when you like, oh no, and like, oh, where are your car at? And you know, I'm like, I don't have a car. What? <laughs> I'm got a car. You know, so you have to. There's this balance, you know, um, that has to be. So now I, I try to seek balance, you know, both for myself and then also understanding that like you can't be drowning and be like, hey y'all, swim, you know. <laughs> Not hard, but you know, you have to, see, kids want to see that there is an alternative, but they also, they want to see it. They don't want to just hear you talk about it. Well, my follow-up to that is for the students in the audience, if any of you want to share, like, what it feels like to see your, your teachers here. Social context. 
Um, and, you know, like you said, there's a moment where, like, we're like, semi kind of proper at the museum, and they're like, oh, man, what's up? Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, being able to switch those roles, so the idea of, like, the mass being, like, this invisible mass that we carry, or, or our soul being as this other entity inside mm. us, right, and, like, allowing these things to come out. Yeah. Um, and so those metaphors or those contexts are like connecting to just the act of wearing a mask. Um, but also that for me, the masks are a way, um, and also like some of these pieces that have faces are ways, like this one's called uh, Brown King, and thinking about these connections of valuing my skin, valuing where I come from and my ancestors, and using, like I, I just feel that you know, it's you know, I was born in Mexico and then raised in the United States, and then being really disconnected, um, I I feel like it's very difficult for me to go back to my roots and really try to connect. And my only way to get there is through like my family, talking to my mom, listening to her heart, talking to listening to these stories as a way for me, like I truthfully believe that I can channel. And when I work, is that I'm sort of making what my ancestors may, may look like or may they work to connect with in some certain way. So it's almost very literal in the sense that I, I think these are the components, and but using brown and, and, and all these gray materials and, and raw materials. So in this case, like in those battle scenes that you see in a movie where like the, so a large animal as a horse gets torn down and fallen, but still keeping the head up a little high, and then sort of like the soul kind of retrieving the body. Um, this piece was also like another version of Baby in a way, and Baby was from the mythology. Um, and in my mythology, there's this whole story of how like a, a sparrow and a, a jaguar become friends and. At the time, you know, like there's like so sorry that there's three fishes and a jaguar. The fishes teach the jaguar how to swim because you know jaguars don't know how to swim, so they help them out. And then a sparrow's flying around and needs help because he's tired from flying. And they they had this conversation and there's this thing of you know like the sparrow has to trust the the jaguar to not eat him, but it rests on his on his teeth. And then because the sparrow is able to rest, um, he the sparrow gives the the jaguar a seed. And that seed is planted then on the head of the fish, which is where the tree comes out, and that's when the land comes into my, excuse me, my mythology. And so those are like little symbols, and then there's about 50 rosaries uh, connected to that, it's made with beadworks, and a lot of motifs from um, Mesoamerica, like a lot of like archaeological sites, like from Oaxaca and different parts of Mexico. And the little thing hanging on the eye, it's Ojo de Renado, supposed to ward off evil spirits. Mm. This is hasta la raiz, uh, which is also a, a jaguar, and thinking about like uh, roots being like, this is one of, this is the newest piece in here, so it's just like thinking of the concept of being uprooted, um, and finding your own roots somehow, and trying to connect with that, and then also just like the texture of how it feels like, like skin, and how like, you know, valuing these skin colors and putting them um, top left is a sparrow's gift, referring to the gift of the land, and it's uh, intended to be a moon. Uh, like I mentioned earlier in the talk, this is uh, an old guy renewed, the huge sculpture, um, and that is, you know, my uh, my my piece that I made it intended for the moon. Um, and sort of just just love the idea of getting lost into something and just working like crazy with all these little things. And, and in the middle, it's like the story is also told visually and, and drywall. 
And all these materials are, are taken from like growing up, uh, working class, and I was just, I've always had a job since I was in high school, and they all been like, uh, I used to build homes, I used to do the drywall, so it's like taking that narrative of construction workers, right, and, and talking to, uh, about that concept. And that's, I, I enjoy that part of my work, because you know, now working um, with youth, or like when people come see my work, it's, I see it as an entryway to talk to a student, you know, that, that says like, well, why is this made out of wood, or why is there drywall? And I'm like, well, it's, it's drywall because that's how you build homes, and I used to build homes, there used to be a drywall, and then there's been moments where it's like, oh, my dad, my dad does that. And I was like, yeah, so your dad's an artist, and he's like, ah, I guess my dad is an artist, right? So it's like valuing that middle class, the working class values, and, and, and has, trying to to show everyone else that, that there's value in that. Um, all these three pieces, left to right, is Don, Hunch, and Baby. Uh, Hunch is my friend that um, was in prison. Um, to be honest, I, know, I don't know exactly what has happened with him. Um, but talking about breaking points, um, he was just uh, just had enough and had to join the rival gang in order to survive the situation. And one thing led to another spiral, and he's in prison. Um, the other two are my friends that were buried. Um, and this is a this is a suspicious messenger. Um, the whole concept of spirituality I've had since I was a little kid. Um, I I used to tell my mom that I was that I would fight the devil, and I would see these these like blobs of things like coming at me. And because I was a little kid, I used to see like just these silly movies and cartoons. I used to like fight it. And then my mom got really freaked out and took me to, we were Catholic, so she took me to uh, this, uh, this prayer circle, which like they put me, you know, I was down on my knees, and there was 20 to 30 people just like touching me and praying, and you know, like, beautiful words like chanting. And uh, I was just recently talking to my mom about it, that I was making a piece, and she said that some of the people that did that, um, that prayer for me are still alive, and they claim that they saw the devil, the heat, uh, body, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, just these interesting stories of mixing it all together. So, cool. you make everything you can do. I'm sorry. You make everything you can do. Um, everything inside this room. Um, yes. <laughs> I was not going to double check. Yes, um, yes I did all, all, all of this and then I collaborated with Matt to do sounds. And during the reception, I worked with a dance company um, with a collective that they did these performances that was intended to send messages to, to my friend. Um, I have a question about the piece, the dark piece. What was the name of it again? Uh, an old god. I felt, I felt like a, a real sense of like home and heart. It was like like a crash, like something you see in the TV. But also then there's all of this rough material and like nails maybe from a nail gun and staples and sharp things and things that can cut you danger. And those two, both of those feelings were really strong and they're all blended together. And I just wondered if that, was that at all your intention or does that resonate? Oh, okay, the the comfort and the danger. Yeah. yeah, I think there is an undercurrent of that. If I'm going to be honest, I think when I was making it, I, I, was, I was pretending that, that it was for the moment. Right? And all the energy that I put into it was sort of like a gift for it. And like I was in New Mexico, there was nobody around. You know, like I had just finished grad school, so nobody was ever going to see anything I was going to make. You know, so like I was just like, I'm just going to do what I want. And I'm going to pretend. Like if I could be anything, and in my studio, I'm gonna pretend to be, you know, someone who just makes, for whatever reason, work for the moon and, and the mountains, and that's okay. It's all fair game in the studio, and so I just went in there and just, I just love the sense of devotion. I think of oh, devotion. Yeah. Yeah, and then so I wanted to kind of show that physically, um, and I think like just the, the, because the nails and all that just work really fast and in construction. I really like going to those homes and like, you know, nail guns, curls breaking 
Okay, speaking of energy, then I'm really into uh, braiding. I, um, Ashley is also called Lee, talks about the idea of braiding and how that's very spiritual, and I also believe that. And, uh, this is the longest I've ever had my hair, and I'm really into braiding, and <laughs> braiding as uh, a way to connect. You know, like when she gets a chance to braid my hair, it's always an opportunity to talk to her and connect with her, and also just braiding as a sense to connect with spirituality and contain your energy and preserve it and, and having it uh, be a part of you and honoring, honoring your ancestors um, as a way of like the hair comes from you, you know, also like the heartbeat, uh, the heartbeat and the bloodline, how that has been 